Early one morning at a park in the city center, a long object with disheveled hair suddenly surfaced on the lake, sending chills down the spines of onlookers. After examining the scene, the police speculated that the woman may have accidentally fallen into the water and drowned. However, there was a small but peculiar detail on the heel of the victim's high-heeled shoe that caught the attention of the forensic examiner. This very detail gradually unraveled the terrifying secrets behind the case. Hello, Crime Documentary Files viewers. Today, we will continue with a series featuring three of the most puzzling and unbelievable cases. At around 7 a.m. on May 10th, 2013, in a park near Longhu Tang Road, Changzhou City, China, a woman's body was found floating in the park's artificial lake. The location of the body was right next to a suspension bridge within the park. Immediately, several morning exercisers gathered around the lake to witness the unfolding scene. About 15 minutes later, the police received the report and quickly arrived at the scene. After several efforts, the police finally retrieved the body from the water. At the time, the victim was wearing a red velvet coat over a blue camisole. She was also wearing black shorts and long black stockings. In her right and left pockets, police found over 400 yuan in cash, equivalent to around 65 US dollars, along with a set of keys. Additionally, around the woman's neck, police discovered a gold necklace. On her right wrist, she wore a gold bracelet and a diamond ring was on the index finger of her right hand. Based on these initial findings, the police ruled out robbery as a motive. Soon after, the forensic examiner arrived at the scene and completed a preliminary examination of the body. Due to being submerged in the lake, the woman's body had already started to bloat. The time of death was estimated by the forensic expert to be between 7 to 10 hours before the body was found, which would place the time of death between 9 p.m. and midnight the previous evening. From the external characteristics, the forensic examiner estimated the woman's age to be between 20 and 30. Since no visible injuries were found on the victim's body, the examiner also ruled out the possibility that she had been attacked before her death. Upon further examination, the forensic expert discovered a significant amount of blood foam in the nasal and oral cavities. Based on the body's physiological response, the examiner deduced that this blood foam could have been caused by a large intake of water, stimulating the nasal and oral cavities of a living person. In other words, it was highly likely that the woman in the red coat had drowned. However, how she ended up in the lake remained a mystery that the police still needed to investigate. Although the woman had a distinctive butterfly tattoo on her chest, investigators were unable to identify her because she had no identification documents on her body. As a result, they took blood samples and fingerprints to be analyzed at the police station. At the same time, the police took a photo of the woman in the red outfit and asked around the park where the incident occurred. However, after numerous inquiries, no one recognized the victim. It wasn't until around 4 p.m. that a young man rushed into the police station to report a missing person. The man, named Li Liang, 29 years old from Jiangsu province, stated that his wife had been missing since the previous evening, and her phone had been turned off. The police then showed Liang the photo of the woman in the red outfit, and he immediately identified her as his wife. Liang told the police that his wife's name was Liu Fengxian, 27 years old, from Sichuan province. At around 9 p.m. the previous evening, Liang noticed that his wife wasn't home. He asked his cousin, Feng Tianlai, who lived with them, and Feng said that Liu had gone out not long ago. However, by around 11 p.m., Feng Xian still hadn't returned home. Liang tried calling her, but her phone was off, which made him increasingly anxious. He then took the family's small truck and started searching for her. After driving around extensively, Liang still couldn't find his wife. He told the police that he tried calling her multiple times that night but couldn't get through. The next morning, Liang searched all of their relatives and friends, but no one had seen her. Desperate, he went to the police station to file a missing person report. He had no idea that his wife had drowned. Upon hearing the tragic news, Liang broke down in tears at the station. After calming down, he began questioning the police about how his wife could have drowned. 
The investigators also found this question puzzling. Upon examining the scene, they discovered that the lake where the incident took place was an artificial one. The depth of the lake was measured at just 4.75 feet, while Fengxian's height was about 5.25 feet. Even if she had accidentally fallen into the lake, it didn't seem plausible that she could have drowned. At this point, the police uncovered an important clue from Liang's statement. He said that two days before the incident, he had bought Fengxian a new electric scooter. On the night of the incident, he called his wife and asked why she was going out so late. Fengxian replied that she wanted to go to the nearby park to practice riding the electric scooter. Based on the clue provided by Liang, the police immediately formed a hypothesis. Could Fengxian have fallen into the lake due to careless driving? Therefore, on the evening of the second day after the incident, investigators returned to the lakeside in the park to continue their search. The result was that, at the bottom of the lake on the opposite side of the suspension bridge, the police retrieved a red electric scooter. Upon initial examination, the police found that the scooter's power switch was still in the on position, indicating that the scooter may have fallen into the artificial lake while it was still running. On the suspension bridge, near the spot where the electric scooter fell, investigators also found a fresh scratch on the edge of the bridge. After comparing and analyzing, the police confirmed that the scratch was caused by Fengxian's electric scooter hitting the bridge before it fell into the water. The investigators also looked into Feng Xian's activities on the night of the incident. According to surveillance footage from the residential area, at 8.57 p.m. on May 9, 2013, she was seen riding the electric scooter at the entrance of the residential complex. Further surveillance footage from a nearby road close to the artificial lake also showed Feng Xian riding the scooter. Even though it was around 9.20 p.m., the footage indicated that Fengxian was riding the scooter with ease, suggesting she was not a beginner in need of practice. Additionally, there was another strange circumstance that raised suspicion among the investigators. Fengxian and Liang's specific residence was in a residential area in the Xinbei district. The park where Fengxian's body was discovered, however, was located in a relatively distant electronic industrial area. The distance between the two locations was about three miles. If, as Liang said, Feng Xian simply wanted to practice riding the scooter at night, why didn't she choose an open space near the residential area? Why would she go to a relatively deserted park three miles away? Moreover, the park didn't have streetlights at night, and the roads were completely dark, making it entirely unsuitable for practicing riding a scooter. Could it be that Feng Xian's real reason for going out that night wasn't to practice riding, but for some secret purpose? To quickly uncover the truth behind the case, the police decided to shift their investigation to focus on Feng Xian's social relationships. According to Liang's statement, he and his wife met online and had only recently married in March 2013. He claimed their relationship was always strong, and since their marriage, Feng Xian hadn't been working outside the home. It was also unusual for her to be out overnight. However, on the night of the incident, Feng Xian unexpectedly went out alone on her scooter. To Liang, this behavior seemed very unusual. Four days after the incident, the city police completed the autopsy on Feng Xian's body. They officially issued a death certificate confirming drowning as the cause of death. At the police station, Feng Xian's mother hesitated to sign the death certificate after reading the autopsy report, and Liang also expressed that he could not accept the conclusion. They both hoped that the police would thoroughly investigate the case to uncover the full truth. To assist with the investigation, Liang even persuaded his in-laws to allow the forensic team to conduct a further examination of the body. At this time, Liang provided the police with an important clue. He mentioned that his wife's recently purchased iPhone was missing from the belongings recovered. He hoped that the police could retrieve it from the lake. Upon hearing this request, the investigators found it a bit strange. They asked Liang why he was so insistent on finding the phone. Liang responded that the phone's call log might reveal important details about the victim's contacts before the incident, which could provide crucial clues. While the explanation sounded reasonable, the police pointed out that they could retrieve the call logs through the phone service provider without needing the physical phone. Additionally, considering the size of the lake, finding a small phone would be challenging. Despite this, 
Liang remained adamant about finding his wife's phone. He even spent over 2,000 yuan to hire divers to search for it. In less than half a day, they indeed found Feng Xian's phone. Liang then handed it over to the police. At this point, the police were able to access Feng Xian's call logs. The records showed that at 8.51 p.m. on the night of the incident, Feng Xian received a call from a number ending in 67116. The call lasted only 58 seconds. 37 minutes later, at 9.28 p.m., Liang called Feng Xian, a call he said was to ask why she was out so late. That call lasted one minute and three seconds. Soon after, at 9.32 p.m., the number ending in 67116 called Feng Xian again. This time, the call lasted only 45 seconds. Given these unusual times and short durations of the calls, the police made a bold hypothesis. On the night of the incident, the victim had lied to her husband, Liang. It was highly likely that the owner of the mysterious phone number was involved in her unexpected outing. As a result, investigators began looking into the phone number ending in 67116. What they discovered was quite bizarre. At the telecommunications office, the police quickly identified the owner of the number as Liu Fengke, Feng Xian's older sister. However, according to Fengke's statement, while the number was registered under her name, she had never actually used it. After registering the number, she had given the SIM card to her younger sister. Clearly, Feng Xian could not have called herself. So who was using this mysterious phone number? The police then questioned Liang again. Liang responded, I also used that phone number for a while, but I switched to a new one later. The old SIM card is probably still at home. Liang added that the SIM card had been managed by his wife. At this point in the investigation, the police had formed a general theory. They believed that Feng Xian had given the SIM card to someone she was closely associated with. Through questioning Feng Tianlai, Feng Xian's cousin, the police learned that the phone number might have been in use by someone named Zhu Zhe. Zhu Zhe, who shared a hometown with Liang, had stayed with Liang and Feng Xian for some time and had a close relationship with them. Following this crucial lead, the police discovered that Zhu Zhe's full name was Zhou Zhu Wei, a 29-year-old from Jiangsu province. He was currently residing in Benyu, a town in Changzhou. However, when the police arrived, they could not find Zhu Wei. Liang also stated, I don't know Zhu Wei's exact whereabouts, as his phone has been turned off as well. Liang told the investigators that about 10 days before Feng Xian's death, Zhu Wei, who had been living with them, suddenly moved out of the rental apartment. At that time, Liang asked him why he was leaving, but Zhu Wei did not provide a clear reason. This unusual situation deepened the investigators' suspicions. Based on the accumulated information, the police speculated that if Zhu Wei had called Feng Xian on the night of the incident, then he was likely at the park where the crime scene was located. So, the investigators began reviewing surveillance cameras on the streets near the park. In less than half a day, they found a clue. In an image captured by a highway surveillance camera, Zhu Wei was seen riding in a taxi. Based on the taxi's license plate, the police were able to track down the driver who had worked that night. According to the driver, around 8 p.m., he indeed dropped off a male passenger near the park where the incident occurred. Further street surveillance footage showed that for a significant amount of time, Zhu Wei did not appear to leave the park. It wasn't until around 4.30 a.m. the next morning that the footage showed Zhu Wei getting into another taxi to leave the park. According to the second taxi driver, Zhu Wei's final destination early that morning was the address registered as his permanent residence. The taxi driver also reported something strange to the police. He said that when Zhu Wei paid the 25 yuan for the ride, the cash was clearly wet. Moreover, there were some water stains left on the taxi seat. From this, the police speculated that on the night of the incident, it was highly likely that Zhu Wei had entered the lake. This discovery significantly increased suspicion that Zhu Wei was the perpetrator. On June 13, 2013, one month after the incident, the police finally succeeded in meeting with Zhu Wei. Facing the police, Zhu Wei did not evade or hide anything. He candidly admitted that on the night of the incident, he had indeed called Feng Xian and asked her to meet him. 
The reason they chose to meet in a dark park was because they were romantically involved. Jue revealed to the police that about a month before the incident, he and Feng Xian had started an affair. To avoid being caught by Liang, Jue decided to move out early, but continued looking for other opportunities to secretly meet with his lover. According to Ju Wei, on the night of the incident, he took a taxi to the park and waited for Feng Xian to arrive. Around 9.30 p.m., Feng Xian rode her electric scooter to their meeting spot. Ju Wei said that after they met, they became intimate and later chatted romantically. It wasn't until around 11 p.m. that Feng Xian suggested heading home. So he got on the back of her electric scooter. At that moment, everything felt comfortable. But when they crossed the suspension bridge, Feng Xian suddenly lost control of the scooter, causing both of them and the scooter to fall into the lake. Ju Wei told the investigators that at that moment, he couldn't even think about Feng Xian. After struggling for a while, he managed to crawl up to the shore and save himself, but Feng Xian disappeared into the dark water. Ju Wei said he was terrified and didn't know what to do, so he just sat on the shore waiting until dawn, when he finally gathered the courage to leave the scene. Because of his shameful romantic relationship with Feng Xian, Ju Wei didn't tell anyone about the accident, nor did he report it to the police. In the end, he chose to run away. Although Ju Wei's account seemed somewhat plausible, the police noticed a major flaw in his story. During the earlier investigation, they had discovered that the lake was not very deep. The average water depth was only about 4.75 feet. Even with the layer of mud at the bottom, the depth increased by only about one to two inches. Furthermore, forensic investigators had found some mud on the heel of Feng Xian's high-heeled shoes, as well as between her stockings and the soles of her shoes. Upon further analysis, the forensic team confirmed that the mud on her shoes was consistent with the mud found at the bottom of the lake. This indicated that Feng Xian's feet had made contact with the lake bed. In other words, after falling into the water that night, it's likely that Feng Xian was standing upright, and with her height of about 5 feet 3 inches plus the extra 4 inches from her high heels, the water level would have only reached her neck. In such a scenario, it would have been difficult for her to drown, unless some external force was involved. And on that night, the only other person at the scene with Feng Xian was the suspect, Ju Wei. However, in the interrogation room, Ju Wei remained silent, refusing to answer no matter how the investigators questioned him. He continued to insist that it was just an accident and expressed deep regret for not saving Feng Xian from drowning. With no breakthrough in Ju Wei's testimony, the police shifted their focus back to the victim. At this point, Liang, Feng Xian's husband, suddenly came to the police station to inquire about the case. Upon learning about the secret relationship between his wife and Ju Wei, Liang didn't show any surprise or anger. Instead, he was more concerned with asking the investigators when the case would be resolved. When can my wife's body be handled? Can you issue a death certificate? The cremation process at the funeral home requires your confirmation, he asked eagerly. These unusual behaviors puzzled the investigators. After the murder, as the husband, Liang initially refused to sign the death certificate, expressing hope that the police would continue investigating to uncover the truth. But more than a month later, when the police had only made a little progress in the investigation, Liang suddenly came forward, requesting the police to conclude the case quickly. This led the police to suspect that there was more to the story. At the same time, the victim's parents rushed to the police station to inquire about the progress of the investigation. They also provided a crucial lead that helped break the case. Feng Xian's mother told the investigators that her daughter had purchased a personal accident insurance policy before she died. This policy was bought by her son-in-law, Liang, after they got married, and the payout was said to be 1 million yuan. Initially, the police didn't pay much attention to this detail, but upon further investigation, they discovered that there was an additional personal accident insurance policy in Feng Xian's name, worth 3 million yuan. Furthermore, this policy included an additional travel accident insurance policy, worth 500,000 yuan. The combined value of the two policies amounted to 4.5 million yuan, or approximately 640,000 US dollars. The police then became suspicious of Liang's insurance purchases. 
What raised even more concern was that investigators learned from the insurance company that the policy Liang had purchased for his wife was only a one-year plan. According to the insurance company's director, short-term, high-coverage personal accident insurance is typically bought as a supplementary policy. However, at the time, Liang insisted on purchasing only this type of insurance. He stated that he only trusted accident insurance. The company explained that this type of insurance is usually only considered by people in high-risk occupations, as the payout is intended to support the insured's family in the event of an accident, helping to prevent financial hardship. When the insurance was initially purchased, Fengxian listed her legal heirs as the beneficiaries, which would typically include a spouse, children, parents, or, in some cases, siblings. However, after investigating further, the police discovered that the beneficiaries of Fengxian's two accident policies were changed one week after the purchase. Liang had changed the beneficiaries so that he was the sole 100% beneficiary. According to the insurance company's records, Liang made this change on March 15, 2013, and about two months later, Fengxian drowned. This led the investigators to make a bold hypothesis. Liang's unusual behavior in purchasing the insurance policies might have been connected to his wife's death. The police decided to focus on the relationship between Liang and Fengxian. What they uncovered were several highly unusual details. According to Fengxian's family, she had lived on her own in Changzhou, Jiangsu province since becoming an adult. She had worked as a restaurant server, a hair salon assistant, and later as a receptionist at an internet cafe. Fengxian felt a lot of pressure from her parents to get married. In early 2013, she met her current husband, Liang, by chance. According to her cousin, Feng Tianlai, although Liang and Fengxian had known each other for less than two months, they quickly registered for marriage. However, their relationship seemed to be going well. As a husband, Liang was quite generous frequently buying Fengxian expensive gifts. In addition to a wedding ring, necklace, and bracelet, Liang bought her several designer handbags. After Fengxian went missing, Liang even went out of his way to ask Feng Tianlai if he had any information about her whereabouts. He then drove his truck around to search for her. Based on the timeline Feng Tianlai provided, the police pulled surveillance footage from the residential area's gate on the night of the incident. The footage revealed that at around 11 p.m. that night, Liang indeed drove his truck out of the residential area. However, according to the later footage, he wasn't out for very long, only about 20 minutes. Moreover, his truck moved very slowly and only appeared on a main road near the residential area. This strange journey didn't seem like a genuine search for someone. Meanwhile, further investigation revealed that Liang had been married before, he and his ex-wife, Huang Yun, had two children, a boy and a girl. Liang and Huang Yun divorced in early February 2013. This was less than two weeks before he met Feng Xian. According to Feng Xian's close friend, Sha Sha, she had met Liang through WeChat at that time. Liang pursued Feng Xian aggressively and was always very generous with his money. Under the pressure of Liang's lavish spending, Feng Xian quickly fell for him. On March 5, 2013, they went to the Civil Affairs Bureau to register their marriage. By this point, they had known each other for less than two weeks. Feng Xian's family questioned her about this whirlwind marriage, but she seemed entirely captivated by Liang's wealth and could not pull herself away. After the marriage, although Liang didn't share a room with Feng Xian, she didn't seem to mind. Not long after, another young man began staying in her room, Liang's close friend and hometown acquaintance, Zhu Wei. The police had encountered many unusual love stories in the past, but there was something about this one that made them suspicious. Through their investigation, the police discovered that before his divorce, Liang had owned an internet cafe with gambling machines. However, by the end of 2012, due to poor business, the cafe had to close. After that, Liang signed a divorce agreement with his ex-wife, in the following months, Liang was unemployed and had no legitimate source of income. According to some relatives and friends, after the cafe went bankrupt, Liang's financial situation was dire. Before the cafe closed, he had borrowed between 400,000 to 500,000 yuan from relatives, which he had not been able to repay. 
Despite this, both before and after marrying Fengxian, Liang was quite generous, buying her not only gold jewelry and handbags, but also an electric scooter and accident insurance. With all this information, the police suspected that Liang and Zhu Wei might have conspired to commit a serious crime, killing Fengxian for the insurance money. To get to the bottom of the case, the investigators decided to interrogate Liang and Zhu Wei separately. However, despite continuous questioning, Zhu Wei remained silent and refused to confess. Meanwhile, Liang cunningly dodged the investigators' questions, often turning the tables by asking, Have you caught the real culprit yet? When will this case be closed? Over time, Liang grew increasingly frustrated and eventually raised his voice, saying to the police, What evidence do you have to arrest me? I will sue you. Due to the lack of concrete evidence, the investigators couldn't come up with a better interrogation strategy. By July 18, 2013, more than a month had passed since Zhu Wei was taken into custody. The investigators believed that the time was right for a breakthrough, so they decided to shift their focus to Zhu Wei. In the interrogation room, it took just one simple statement from the investigator to get Zhu Wei to confess the full truth about the crime. The investigator told Zhu Wei, Your accomplice, Liang, has already been taken into custody by us. At that moment, Zhu Wei's expression shifted from indifference to shock. He then confessed to the investigator that Feng Xian did not die from drowning. She died at his hands. Rewinding to the night of May 9, 2013, Zhu Wei had called Feng Xian and arranged to meet her at the park. In reality, he had already planned to kill her in the lake. However, due to their romantic relationship, Zhu Wei admitted that Feng Xian was someone with whom he shared many memories. He said he was torn about whether or not to go through with it. Around 11 p.m. that night, Feng Xian insisted on going home, fearing that if she didn't, Liang would discover the secret of their relationship. Even then, Zhu Wei remained hesitant, unable to bring himself to leave. This infuriated Feng Xian, and she lashed out at Zhu Wei like a scornful woman, berating him harshly. Her intense outburst only strengthened Zhu Wei's resolve. At around 11.15 p.m. that night, Zhu Wei pretended to drive Feng Xian home on the electric scooter. When they reached the suspension bridge, Zhu Wei noticed a section of the railing was broken. He intentionally steered the scooter towards it. When both of them and the scooter fell into the water, due to the shallow depth, both Zhu Wei and Feng Xian quickly stood up in the lake. Before Feng Xian could gather her senses, Zhu Wei lunged at her, forcefully pushing her head under the water with both hands until she stopped struggling. Once it was over, Zhu Wei slowly crawled back to the shore. He confessed that he felt regret, because, despite everything, Feng Xian had been his only lover. Next, Zhou Zhu Wei fully confessed to the police the real reason he ruthlessly murdered Feng Xian. In late 2012, after Liang's business venture with the gambling machines failed, he was completely out of money. His creditors began coming after him, and a debt of 500,000 yuan was due by June 2013. Facing this dire situation, Liang came up with a horrific plan. To carry out this scheme, he first concocted an excuse to divorce his ex-wife, Huang Yun, and then began the first step of finding the right target. According to Liang's testimony, he initially selected a total of three potential targets, but after filtering through them, he determined that none of them were suitable. On February 20th, 2013, through the Shake to Find Friends feature on WeChat, Liang met Feng Xian, who was also working in Changzhou. Liang told the police that Feng Xian was the perfect target for him. She had been single for many years, never had a stable job, and her life was far from ideal. Moreover, as a girl who loved money above all else, she was relatively simple-minded. Because of this, within less than two weeks of meeting, Liang was able to completely win Feng Xian over with money. His proposal for marriage was soon accepted by Feng Xian. When they received their marriage certificate, Liang and Feng Xian didn't meet each other's parents, nor did they hold any wedding ceremony. Once he secured the legal marriage, Liang immediately began the second phase of his plan to kill his wife for the insurance money by purchasing life insurance. The day after their marriage registration, Liang deliberately showed Feng Xian the insurance policies he had previously purchased. The beneficiary on the policies was still his ex-wife, Huang Yun. 
As expected, these policies quickly provoked Feng Xian's jealousy. At that moment, Liang took advantage of the situation and proposed a plan. He told her that he could change all the beneficiaries on the insurance policies to Feng Xian. Anyone familiar with the psychology of women could guess that at this point, Feng Xian couldn't resist anymore. So, at Feng Xian's request, Liang changed the beneficiary on his insurance policy from his ex-wife Huang Yun to Feng Xian. At the same time, Liang also took the opportunity to purchase a personal accident insurance policy for Feng Xian worth 1 million yuan. Three days later, Liang purchased another personal accident policy online, this time for 3 million yuan. To convince Feng Xian to agree to this second policy, Liang devised a clever scheme. During a shopping trip to the mall, Liang suddenly suggested buying Feng Xian a car. Overjoyed, Feng Xian eagerly began preparing to get her driver's license. At this point, Liang suggested that, to ensure her safety while driving, he would purchase an additional 3 million yuan accident insurance policy for her. At that moment, Feng Xian, immersed in happiness, suspected nothing. To further deceive her, over the next two months, Liang spent around 50,000 yuan, about 7,000 US dollars, on various gold and silver jewelry for Feng Xian. This allowed her to stay at home without working, enjoying Liang's gifts. It was at this point that Liang began preparing the third step of his plan to kill his wife for the insurance money, staging an accident. To avoid raising suspicion in the future police investigation, Liang needed an outsider to create the accident. That's when Zhu Wei, Liang's former classmate from middle school, entered the picture. According to Zhu Wei's testimony, he had always admired Liang. He said, I admired Liang for marrying the beautiful Huang Yun and having two beloved children. In life, Zhu Wei was a quiet and awkward young man who didn't socialize well with others. As a result, he was often bullied. At such times, Liang would stand up for him. Because of this, Zhu Wei believed that Liang truly cared about him. And if there was anything Liang ever needed help with, he felt obligated to repay him. Therefore, when Liang proposed the plan to kill his wife for the insurance money, the obedient Zhu Wei quickly agreed. There was a silent understanding between Liang and Zhu Wei about the murder plan, and they didn't discuss it much. As the mastermind, Liang instructed Zhu Wei to move into his rental house. To get Zhu Wei closer to Feng Xian, Liang purposely didn't share a bed with her, and he directed Zhu Wei to seduce his newlywed wife. To win over Feng Xian, Liang secretly gave Zhu Wei money to buy a brand new electric scooter as a gift for her. Liang would regularly create opportunities for Zhu Wei and Feng Xian to be alone together. After some time of orchestrating their interactions, Zhu Wei and Feng Xian actually began a secret affair. According to Liang's testimony, his intention in having Zhu Wei get close to Feng Xian was to find a chance to lure her out, setting up the plan to stage an accidental death. After more than two months of careful plotting, Liang felt the timing was right. On the evening of May 8th, Liang instructed Zhu Wei to call Feng Xian and arrange a private meeting, but she refused. The next evening, on May 9th, Zhu Wei called again to set up a date, and this time, Feng Xian, unable to resist her loneliness, fell into the trap. Poor Feng Xian went out on her scooter, thinking she was deceiving her newlywed husband Liang, not realizing that every move was being orchestrated by him. After Feng Xian left, Liang admitted that even he wasn't sure if Zhu Wei's actions would succeed. However, he had already coached Zhu Wei on a story to use in case the police questioned him. Liang told Zhu Wei that if the police asked about the incident, he should say that he and Feng Xian were romantically involved, and after their meeting, Feng Xian accidentally fell into the lake while riding her scooter. The next morning, Zhu Wei sought out Liang to tell him everything that had happened, but Liang, skilled at keeping up appearances, acted disinterested and refused to listen. After completing the third step, Liang moved on to the final part of his plan, filing the insurance claim. According to Liang, he hadn't initially planned to execute the insurance scam so quickly. However, his creditors were pressuring him, and Liang claimed he was a man of his word. He had promised to pay off all his debts by June, and to fulfill that promise, he felt he had no choice but to make money, regardless of the method. 
This is why he decided to put the plan into action in early May. In the end, although it took more than two months of investigation to uncover the full details of the case, the Changzhou City Police received a lot of praise for solving this incredibly complex and sophisticated crime. On January 17, 2014, the Jiangsu Province Intermediate People's Court delivered the first instance verdict. Defendant Li Liang was convicted of murder and sentenced to death according to the law. He was also sentenced to nine years in prison for insurance fraud and fined 50,000 wen. Defendant Zhu Wei was convicted of murder and received a death sentence with a two-year suspension. He was also sentenced to six years in prison for insurance fraud and fined 30,000 yuan. This verdict was widely accepted by both the public and the victim's family. In the northeastern part of downtown, Shanghai lies a place called Hong Ko District. In this neighborhood lived a newlywed couple. The husband, Zhou Xiaodong, was 29 years old and worked as a sales associate at a shopping mall. His wife, Yang Liping, the same age as her husband, was a primary school teacher teaching literature. To outsiders, Xiaodong appeared to be a handsome and charming man, while Li Ping was gentle, beautiful, and kind. They were considered a picture-perfect couple. But was that the reality? Beneath the surface, unresolved tensions between the two would eventually lead to a shocking tragedy that shook the city. Not long after their marriage, the gentle wife was found, nothing more than a cold body inside her husband's freezer. So, what exactly happened? The story begins on February 1st, 2017. It was also the fifth day of the Chinese Lunar New Year, a day traditionally celebrated as the Kitchen Gods Festival. Coincidentally, it was also the 60th birthday of Yang Ganlian, Liping's father. Naturally, on such a special day, many friends and relatives came to congratulate him. However, two people he was eagerly waiting for had not shown up. His daughter, Liping, and his son-in-law, Xiao Dong. As time passed and the evening drew closer, there was still no sign of them. Even more concerning, Ganlian hadn't seen his daughter in six months, and they couldn't get in touch with her by phone. Communication had only been through WeChat messages. This day was special yet Lipping didn't show up. This was highly unusual, and Ganlian was certain that his daughter would never behave this way without an unavoidable reason. During this time, Ganlian and his wife tried repeatedly to call their daughter, but they couldn't reach her. Even when the line connected, no one responded. Liping, however, did send a message via WeChat that read, Dad, Mom, I'm sorry. Xiaodong and I are dealing with some issues. We need a little time to work things out. Please don't worry. We'll come visit you soon after we sort everything out. Despite this message, Ganlian and his wife weren't reassured. They worried that something serious might have happened between their daughter and son-in-law. Concerned for their safety, they decided to contact the police for help. The police immediately launched an investigation, but in the early stages, they couldn't find any clues. No one knew what had happened to Liping and Xiaodong, they seemed to have vanished mysteriously. Ganlian and his wife felt desperate and anxious, hoping the police would soon locate their daughter. Not long after, someone provided the police with a few leads. According to the witness, they had seen a suspicious person near the area where Liping and Zhao Dong lived. The police considered this an important lead and launched a comprehensive search. However, after several weeks, they still had no news about the couple. Mr. Ganlian received a message via WeChat saying that her phone was broken and she couldn't take calls. He then tried to arrange a meal with his daughter, but she declined, citing a busy work schedule and saying she wouldn't make it back in time. A few days earlier, Lipping had sent a WeChat message to her mother saying, I'm heading to Hong Kong with friends to celebrate the Lunar New Year. I'll come back to visit you afterward, and if there's anything urgent, I'll contact you via WeChat. However, five days had passed, and her parents still couldn't reach her. Their worry began to grow. Given that it was such a special day, no matter how busy their daughter was, she should have returned home. Mr. Ganlian, who hadn't seen his daughter for months, had a growing sense of unease. By 5 p.m. that day, he contacted his son-in-law's mother, Mrs. Zhou, who informed him that Lipping had encountered some trouble, and they were at the police station. 
she asked both parents to come to the station. Upon hearing this, Mr. Ganlian and his wife immediately set off. On the way, Mr. Ganlian repeatedly reassured his wife. At this point, they thought that perhaps their children had been involved in an accident or an altercation which had brought them to the police station. But when they arrived, the news that hit them was like a bolt of lightning. Their daughter, Liping, had been murdered. Liping was the youngest of three siblings, which is why Mr. Ganlian and his wife had always cherished her dearly. He described his daughter as having a gentle nature, someone who never raised her voice and never had arguments with anyone. Even when she was hurt, she would quietly retreat to cry in private. After finishing high school, Liping was accepted into the Chinese language department at Shanghai Normal University. Upon graduating from college, she became a language teacher at a top primary school in Shanghai. Being hired to teach at this prestigious school was no easy feat and required going through several rounds of selection. Liping took her work seriously and was highly responsible, quickly earning the position of head teacher for her class. In addition to her teaching job, Liping had a deep love for literature. She enjoyed reading, especially classic Chinese literature, and she also loved writing. Liping often shared her writings and reflections on her WeChat account. However, her life completely changed when someone entered the picture. In 2012, when Liping was 25, she met Xiaodong through a mutual friend. Both of them were the same age, and Liping quickly realized they had a lot in common. She was attracted to Xiaodong from the start. His handsome appearance was exactly what Liping liked. In her eyes, Xiaodong resembled her idol, Miyavi, a Japanese guitarist, singer, and songwriter. As they entered their second year of knowing each other, Liping and Xiaodong began dating. However, Liping's parents were unaware of the relationship. At this point, Xiaodong suddenly disappeared, leaving Liping very worried. She had no idea where her boyfriend had gone. A year later, Xiao Dong reappeared and explained the reason for his disappearance. He told Liping that he had discovered a brain tumor that couldn't be treated when he was examined at the hospital. So, he left Shanghai and went to live alone at the base of a snowy mountain in Tibet, drinking snowmelt and eating wild rabbits. Miraculously, after some time, his headaches began to subside. When Xiao Dong returned to the hospital for a checkup, the doctors found that the brain tumor had vanished. Afterward, he decided to return to Shanghai. Surprisingly, Liping believed Xiaodong's story. She felt heartbroken over what her boyfriend had gone through and admired his courage for facing such an illness on his own. However, Liping still didn't tell her parents about her relationship with Xiaodong until one day, Xiaodong attended a wedding and posted about it on social media. This was how Liping's family first learned she had a boyfriend. In the photo, Liping was holding Xiaodong's hand, a sweet smile on her face. Liping also told her parents that Xiaodong was a thoughtful and caring person who often cooked for her. Liping's colleagues had even seen Xiaodong come to her school to help her clean and set up the classroom before lessons. To others, they seemed like a loving and affectionate couple. At this point, everything appeared to be going well. However, Liping's family still wasn't entirely satisfied with Xiaodong. After making their relationship public to her family, Xiaodong had come over for meals a few times, but during those visits, he only gave short, curt answers to the family's questions. After eating, he would quickly retreat to Liping's bedroom. Due to Xiaodong's lack of courtesy and respect, Liping's parents were clearly dissatisfied with him. However, they respected their daughter's choice and did not interfere with the relationship. On the last day of 2015, Liping and Xiaodong went to the Civil Affairs Bureau to obtain their marriage certificate. By the end of May 2016, they held a wedding banquet at the Marriott Hotel. However, at that time, Xiaodong's family was not financially well off. When the couple got married, they didn't throw a large banquet, but invited just seven tables of close friends. At the wedding, Liping didn't even wear a wedding dress opting instead for a white blouse and jeans, while Xiaodong wore a neat suit. After getting married, Liping moved to Xiaodong's residence in Hongku District, Shanghai. It was an old residential area built in the 1950s. 
Xiaodong's family lived in Building 28, which had five floors in total, and the young couple lived in apartment 404 on the fourth floor. Initially, Xiaodong's mother lived with her son, but after the wedding, she moved out. The apartment was about 375 square feet, consisting of a kitchen, a bedroom, a bathroom, and a small balcony. It was quite small and cramped, but it was still a decent start. However, in that home, Xiaodong had a very unusual hobby. He liked to raise animals such as lizards, snakes, and spiders. At one point, he had more than 10 of these creatures, which he kept in separate glass boxes stacked along the wall of the balcony. Initially, Lipping didn't like these animals, leading to many arguments between the couple. As for Lipping's disappearance, Mr. Ganlian said the last time he saw his daughter was on October 1st, 2016, when she and Xiaodong invited both sides of the family for a meal. After that, Liping and Xiaodong had visited her parents' home once, but her father wasn't there, only her mother was home. That was also the last time her mother saw her. Afterward, strange things began happening. They couldn't reach their daughter by phone, and Liping consistently declined requests to meet through WeChat. Finally, on February 1st, 2017, which was also Mr. Ganlian's 60th birthday, Xiaodong's mother initially planned to attend the party before 3 p.m. However, at 1 p.m., she unexpectedly received a message from her son saying, I need you to come to my place for something. Worried, Xiaodong's mother tried calling him, only to find that his phone was turned off. She then called her ex-husband, Xiaodong's father, asking him to go to their son's house to see what had happened. When Xiaodong's parents arrived at his house, they were hit with shocking news. Xiaodong confessed to his parents that three months earlier, he had accidentally killed his wife. Xiaodong's mother couldn't believe it. She asked him, Why did you do this? But Xiaodong didn't answer any of her questions. He just kept repeating the same three words, I miss you, mom. I miss you, mom. Next, Xiaodong's mother asked, Where is Liping? He pointed toward the balcony and said, She's in the freezer. After hearing this, Xiaodong's mother was in shock. But after calming down, she advised her son to turn himself in at the police station. Xiaodong's parents then took him to the police station to confess. Liping's parents also came to the police station, where they were told the horrific news that their daughter had died. The police informed them that Liping had been killed three months prior, and the person responsible was Xiaodong, who had been pretending to be his wife when communicating with them through WeChat. According to Xiaodong's confession after his arrest, the exact date he killed his wife was October 18, 2016. He recalled that three days earlier, on October 15, they had gone on a trip together to Hangzhou. However, because they couldn't book the hotel Liping wanted, they had several arguments. As a result, the trip ended on a sour note. On October 18th, two days after they returned from Hangzhou, Lipping continued to bring up the issue with the hotel. Xiaodong, feeling frustrated, suddenly grabbed Liping by the neck, intending to stop her from nagging about it. However, he squeezed too hard, causing Liping to suffocate and die. Realizing his wife was dead, Xiaodong panicked and didn't tell anyone. He considered taking his own life to join her, but by the time of his father-in-law's 60th birthday, Xiao Dong still hadn't followed through. Eventually, he confessed his crime to his parents and then turned himself in to the police. But was the truth really as Xiao Dong claimed? Was this truly an accidental killing? And what exactly had he been doing during the three months following the crime? As for Xiao Dong, he was born in November 1987 in Shanghai to a regular family. However, when Xiao Dong was 10 years old, his parents divorced and he lived with his mother. But life in Shanghai was expensive, so Xiao Dong's mother had to spend much of her time working, leaving her with limited time to care for her son. Due to the lack of parental attention, Xiao Dong became addicted to video games, spending entire days playing, and his academic performance declined significantly. While Xiaodong was still in high school, he was involved in a group robbery and was arrested by the police on Nanjing Pedestrian Street. Since he was a minor at the time, he was released after being reprimanded. After graduating from high school, Xiaodong enrolled in a vocational school, but he didn't learn anything useful 
and was merely getting by. At the age of 19, he dropped out and worked at various department stores, but he never stayed at any job for long. Despite these setbacks, Xiao Dong wasn't entirely without merit. He had one distinct advantage, his good looks. Xiao Dong took great care of his appearance, paying attention to his clothes and hairstyle, and he always wore an attractive cologne. Neighbors had a good impression of him, considering him polite and soft-spoken. In 2007, when Xiao Dong was 20, he auditioned for a show called I Act, I Sing, hosted by Shanghai's Oriental TV. Through this program, Xiao Dong gained some fame. Although he didn't make it far in the competition, he still attracted a number of fans who idolized him as their prince. However, reality soon hit, and Xiao Dong found himself working at a foreign department store for a monthly salary of just 1,800 yuan, around $250. Even with such a modest income, Xiao Dong frequently partied with friends at bars, leading a lavish lifestyle with no end in sight. His striking appearance caught the attention of many women, and Xiao Dong began to see this as a potential pathway to success. As a result, he regularly visited bars, even borrowing money or using credit cards to buy expensive clothes and jewelry to cultivate the image of a wealthy man. He started targeting affluent women, dating them, and maintaining relationships with several women, all under the guise of love. By 2012, at 25 years old, Xiao Dong had accumulated a significant amount of debt due to his extravagant spending. Around this time, he met Li Ping, a woman his age. Xiao Dong was drawn to Li Ping's striking looks and her captivating eyes, while Li Ping felt that Xiao Dong was simple and easy to control. Initially, Xiao Dong didn't immediately pursue Li Ping, keeping their relationship ambiguous. At that time, he was also dating another wealthy woman. In fact, he even had a tattoo on his arm that read, Red and an Endless Love, January 17th, 2012. Red was Xiao Dong's English name, and the date marked when he met the rich woman. A year later, in October 2013, Xiao Dong was still dating the wealthy woman, but he had also begun a romantic relationship with Li Ping. Sometimes he would bring both women to gatherings with friends, and other times he would take only one of them. Surprisingly, he managed to juggle both relationships without anyone noticing. While dating Li Ping, Xiao Dong was still deeply in debt. He began to occasionally mention his recent financial struggles to her. Blinded by love, Li Ping didn't hesitate to use her savings to help her boyfriend pay off his debts. At this point, Li Ping seemed certain that Xiao Dong was the man she wanted to marry. She introduced him to her parents, but they were not impressed. They felt he was too flashy and untrustworthy, so they opposed their daughter's relationship with him. However, Li Ping was already deeply in love and couldn't easily break away. She ignored her parents' advice and insisted on staying with Xiao Dong. On December 31, 2015, Xiao Dong and Li Ping officially registered their marriage. After the wedding, Li Ping moved into Xiao Dong's home, while Xiao Dong's mother moved in with other relatives. To outsiders, they seemed like a newlywed couple deeply in love. However, according to Xiao Dong, Li Ping often argued with him over small matters. Sometimes she was unhappy with the meals. Other times she didn't like the things Xiao Dong bought. On the other hand, Xiao Dong didn't like Li Ping maintaining too many connections with her friends. He tightly controlled her, forbidding her from attending gatherings alone and even more so from interacting with other men. This led to many arguments between them. On one occasion, Xiao Dong even uninstalled the WeChat app from Li Ping's phone. The police also uncovered that similar issues had occurred before they were married. At one point, Li Ping had posted on Weibo, saying, In a few days, I will have my WeChat account deleted. If anyone wants to reach me, please send me a message or call. From this message, it was clear that Xiao Dong was controlling and overbearing. He was overly strict with his wife but lacked self-control. Just six months into their marriage, Li Ping discovered that Xiao Dong was still involved in ambiguous relationships with several other women. Xiao Dong even pretended to be single and met privately with some of the women. When Li Ping discovered this, it led to a huge argument between them. After being caught, Xiao Dong promised to change his ways and knelt down, begging for his wife's forgiveness. 
he hastily wrote a pledge on a piece of paper. It stated, I promise to only be with you. I promise not to send messages or contact anyone else. My phone will be available for you to check every day. You have the right to use my phone while I'm resting, and all the data on my phone can be accessed at any time. Xiaodong's signature was written in the bottom left corner. However, the pledge proved to be ineffective, as Xiaodong continued to secretly maintain relationships with other women. Besides the issue of infidelity, finances were another major cause of arguments between the couple. They lived in an old house that had been left by Xiaodong's mother, and Liping suggested they renovate the home, but Xiaodong couldn't afford it. He told Liping to handle the financial matters herself. The ongoing arguments left Xiaodong feeling drained. He didn't have strong feelings for Liping, and his decision to stay with her was mostly due to financial benefits. Now, with Liping unwilling to spend money on him and restricting his freedom to socialize, Xiaodong began thinking about divorce. Two months after writing the pledge, on August 25th, they had another major argument. They went to the civil office to initiate divorce proceedings, but things didn't go as planned, and they eventually returned home without finalizing the process. Liping didn't want to end the marriage abruptly. She still believed Xiao Dong was a good person, and that he could change. However, what Liping didn't know was that after this argument, Xiao Dong began considering a more sinister plan. After the failed divorce attempt, Xiao Dong purchased two books online, one on forensic anatomy and the other on philosophy of death, which detailed crime scenes and how to store bodies in a freezer. He also purchased a 202 liter freezer online. Xiao Dong placed the freezer on the balcony of his apartment since the space inside was limited. To make room for it, he sold two of his pet pythons. Additionally, he purchased a security camera, installing it to face the freezer. Whenever someone approached the freezer, Xiao Dong's phone would receive a notification. Around the same time, the department store where Xiao Dong worked was facing continuous losses and preparing to exit the Chinese market. Xiao Dong didn't wait to be laid off, he voluntarily resigned. However, at home, he lied to Liping, telling her that he had been recognized for his excellent work performance and would be sent to Hong Kong for training, with his salary increasing to 20,000 yuan per month. He hoped that Li Ping would quit her job at the school and move to Hong Kong with him. Initially, Li Ping was hesitant, but after Xiao Dong's persistent flattery and lies, she eventually agreed to leave her job. However, likely out of concern for her parents, Li Ping didn't tell them about her resignation. By October 14th, Li Ping had completed all the necessary paperwork and officially left her job at the school. On that same day, she visited her parents one last time. The next day, Xiao Dong took Li Ping on a trip to Hangzhou. While there, the couple had a disagreement. According to Xiao Dong, the argument was sparked because he couldn't book a hotel that Li Ping was satisfied with. This cut their trip short, and they decided to return to Shanghai the following day. Upon returning, Xiao Dong wasn't able to secure high-speed train tickets and had to buy regular train tickets instead leading to another heated argument between the two. After arriving home, Xiao Dong tried to calm his wife down, but to no avail. Two days after returning from Hangzhou, on the morning of October 17, 2016, at around 10 a.m., Xiao Dong woke up to Liping repeatedly talking to him. He became increasingly irritated, and his emotions spiraled out of control. Xiao Dong used both hands to strangle Liping until she stopped breathing. Once he confirmed that she was dead, he wrapped her body in a large blanket and placed it inside the freezer. After cleaning the crime scene and disposing of the bedding, Xiao Dong transferred 45,000 yuan from Li Ping's Alipay account into his own and spent over 100,000 yuan using her credit cards. In addition, he took out loans in Li Ping's name, borrowing over 200,000 yuan. Altogether, Xiao Dong accumulated more than 500,000 yuan, about $70,000. This was a significant sum of money in China at the time. Xiao Dong didn't stop there. He repeatedly used his deceased wife's ID card to rent hotel rooms with different women and used the money he had taken to go on trips, shop, and indulge in a lavish lifestyle. 
While carrying out these heartless actions, Xiaodong continued using Leaping's WeChat account to send messages to her friends and frequently updated her WeChat status. Whenever someone called or sent a voice chat request, Xiaodong, pretending to be Leaping, would respond by saying, Her phone is broken and she can only chat via text. The night before he turned himself in, Xiaodong played the game Honor of Kings all night, from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. During this time, he only left the house once, to throw Liping's phone and ID card into the river, and then returned home to continue playing. The next morning, which was his father-in-law's 60th birthday celebration, Xiaodong realized he could no longer hide the truth. After a period of internal struggle, he decided to confess. When Liping's parents heard the news of their daughter's murder, they were devastated and outraged by Xiaodong's actions, they refused to accept any apologies or compensation from Xiaodong's family. Xiaodong's mother was deeply saddened to learn that her son was a murderer, but she believed it was an accidental act, not premeditated. She hired a lawyer for her son. Xiaodong told the lawyer that he had unintentionally strangled Liping. When the lawyer asked why he didn't try to save her, Xiaodong said, I thought about calling for help, but when I saw that Liping wasn't moving, I panicked and became confused. So, I just stared at her for the next three hours, confirming that she had died. This statement was completely at odds with his actions after the crime. If he had truly felt remorse, he wouldn't have stolen his wife's assets and spent the money on his own lavish lifestyle. A year after the crime, Xiaodong's trial took place at the Shanghai No. 2 Intermediate People's Court. Xiaodong was charged with intentional homicide. During the trial, he recounted his relationship with Leaping and described how he killed her and then hid her body. However, he only admitted to concealing the body, refusing to acknowledge the charge of intentional murder. Xiaodong claimed that he bought the freezer to store mice as he kept snakes and lizards at home. As for the two books he purchased, Forensic Anatomy and Philosophy of Death, Xiaodong claimed they belonged to Leaping. He insisted that he wasn't a reader and had never touched those books. However, the prosecution did not accept this perspective. After investigating, they found that the delivery address for the two books Xiaodong purchased was not the home in Hongku district, but rather his father's house. After receiving the books, Xiaodong brought them to his own home. This suggests that he didn't want his wife to know about the existence of these books. Additionally, Xiaodong's method of committing the crime closely matched the descriptions in the books. Regarding the true motive of the perpetrator, only Xiaodong's testimony is available, and no one else can verify the truth of what happened. Therefore, this was clearly a case of premeditated and intentional murder. Moreover, Xiaodong's confession happened on his father-in-law's birthday. Xiaodong was aware that he could no longer hide the truth and confessed only after being persuaded by his parents. Had he been able to, he would have continued to keep the secret. For this reason, the prosecution argued that the court should not lessen his punishment. In the end, the Shanghai No. 2 Intermediate People's Court sentenced Xiaodong to death for the crime of intentional murder and embezzlement of his wife's assets. However, his family filed an appeal. A year later, the Shanghai Higher People's Court upheld the original sentence, rejecting the appeal. After the trial, a judge from the appellate hearing revealed to the media that, after murdering his wife on the morning of the incident, Xiaodong called to book a round-trip flight to Seoul, South Korea, at noon. By 2 p.m., he had called some friends to arrange a meetup and went out with them to party at a bar that evening. These actions show that Xiaodong was not panicked after the crime, but instead, he systematically arranged his affairs. Therefore, there would be no reduction in his sentence. In June 2020, Zhou Xiaodong was executed according to the court's ruling. His cruel life ended more than 1,300 days after he confessed. It was truly unfortunate that Yang Liping had married such a man. However, this serves as a warning to many, never be too trusting of someone's outward appearance. The next case took place in Adelaide, about 680 miles from Sydney. On December 31st, 2014, a 25-year-old Chinese woman named Fang Ting was staying at a four-star hotel in Adelaide, working a night shift. Fang, also known by her nickname Honey, 
was a high-end tour guide based in Sydney. However, in reality, her role was more focused on catering to wealthy gentlemen during luxury tours. It was New Year's Eve, just hours before the start of the new year. Fang was wearing a light-colored dress with her long hair flowing down, walking and speaking on the phone, seemingly calm and composed. But no one knew that at that moment, she was unknowingly walking toward her death. High-end tour guides like Fang rarely worked in the cities where they lived, as they feared encountering previous clients. This time, Fang had planned to work in Adelaide for a few days, intending to return to Sydney with her remaining commission after deducting intermediary fees. Over the past year and a half, she had visited Adelaide eight times without any issues. At around 7 a.m. on January 1st, 2015, a Chinese man named Mr. Shin arrived at the hotel. He was Fang's driver, essentially acting as her handler or intermediary in her business dealings. Both of them worked for a travel company named Sweet Baby. Mr. Shin was responsible for arranging women like Fang from the eastern states to travel to Adelaide to meet clients. These clients were typically scheduled through social media apps. Mr. Shin would pick these women up from the airport, take them to their hotels, and provide food and toiletries so they wouldn't have to leave their rooms. That morning, after parking his car, Mr. Shin called Fang, but there was no answer. Thinking she had overslept, he went up to the 12th floor of the hotel and used the key card to open her room. Upon entering, he heard the sound of running water coming from the bathroom. Feeling a bit awkward, Mr. Shin assumed that Fang was either showering or with a client, so he quietly left and returned to the hotel lobby to wait. After a few minutes, he called her again, but still, no one answered. He even tried calling the room from the hotel's front desk, but there was no response. This began to worry Mr. Shin, though his concern wasn't that something had happened to Fang, but rather that she might not have paid the intermediary fees before leaving. The driver returned to the room on the 12th floor at 7.55 a.m. The curtains were drawn, making the room dimly lit, with only a small beam of light seeping through the gap between the curtains. The sound of running water in the bathroom still hadn't stopped. This time, he looked around and noticed what appeared to be someone slumped in the corner of the room. Mr. Shin approached to check. The person resembled Fang, with a cloth over her face and a pool of blood surrounding her. A chill ran down his spine, and the scene imprinted itself in his mind. Summoning his courage, the driver removed the cloth. A horrifying sight unfolded before him. Mr. Shin was terrified and collapsed to the floor, exclaiming, Isn't that Fang? He ran out of the hotel and immediately called the company's director, Mr. Chen, to explain the situation. Upon hearing the news, Mr. Chen rushed to the hotel to meet with Mr. Shin. Neither of them knew what to do next, and they discussed how to handle the situation in the hotel lobby. Meanwhile, the hotel manager went up to Fang's room after receiving complaints from the guests below that water had leaked from the floor above. Upon entering the room, the manager quickly discovered Fang's body. Noticing the commotion at the reception desk, Mr. Shin and Mr. Chen suspected that the body had been found, so they approached the front desk to explain the situation. By then, it was 8.35 a.m., and the hotel manager immediately called emergency services. The police arrived promptly and sealed off the scene. The victim was Fang, a woman who weighed only about 105 pounds, petite and fragile. She was found face down on the wet floor, wearing a long-sleeved pink sweater, a t-shirt, and black leggings. A blood-soaked blanket had been used to cover her body. Her neck showed signs of a deep knife wound, a five-inch gash that had severed her windpipe and carotid artery. Fang had been unable to breathe and lost a significant amount of blood, leaving her unable to resist. Ultimately, she died from excessive blood loss. Near her body were several bloodstains, including on the sofa and mattress. Additionally, the mattress had been slightly moved, suggesting that Fang had struggled there. Forensic experts confirmed that she had suffered at least nine severe blows to her head and face, as well as multiple cuts on her body, with the neck wound being the fatal blow. Furthermore, forensic personnel discovered two strange crescent-shaped wounds on Fang's head. The police quickly found the murder weapon in the bathroom sink, a razor blade wrapped in a wet baby wipe. The wipe had also absorbed a significant amount of blood. 
In the bathtub, there was a blanket covering Fang's iPhone. Since the faucet had been running all night, water had overflowed from the tub and started leaking to the floor below. The water had a faint reddish tint. Based on the crime scene, police concluded that this was a brutal murder. But who killed Fang Ting, and what was their motive? At this point, Australian police worked to reconstruct what had happened in the room that night, based on the clues they had. By monitoring the frequency with which Fang's hotel room door had been opened, using the hotel's surveillance system, they could identify all of the clients Fang had seen in recent days. Fang's cell phone, found in the bathtub, was still functional and contained thousands of messages. These provided significant clues for the police to understand what had happened that day. To clarify specific information about the clients Fang had served, the police summoned the owner of the travel agency and Mr. Shin to the station around 6 p.m. on January 1st. Both men fully cooperated with the authorities, providing the nicknames and phone numbers of all the clients who had booked Fang's services in recent days. Since Fang had checked into the hotel on the 29th, she had served a total of 16 clients, all of them Chinese except for one foreigner. For each client, Fang had recorded the service times and stored the information on her cell phone. The police hoped that these details would help them uncover the truth behind the crime. In the past few days, Fang had earned about 8,000 Australian dollars. However, the police only found 4,000 Australian dollars in Fang's drawer. Before the police arrived at the scene, only Mr. Shin and Mr. Chen had been there, and both insisted that they hadn't touched the money. This led authorities to consider that the killer might have murdered Fang for the money. Based on the hotel's surveillance footage, the last person Fang called to her room was Bao Zhongguang, a 27-year-old Chinese-Korean man with no prior criminal record. Around 10 p.m. on December 31st, Bao entered Fang's hotel room, and notably, he had initially only booked her services for one hour. Based on the notes in Fang's phone at 10.40 p.m., she sent a message to Mr. Shin saying that Bao, the client, wanted to extend his service for another hour, and Mr. Shin agreed. But just a few minutes later, Fang sent another message to Mr. Shin stating that Bao was willing to pay extra to stay overnight. This meant Fang would have to cancel two other clients who had already booked her services. It's important to note that the overnight fee in this industry was typically around 1,500 Australian dollars. But Bao said, I'll pay you 2,100 Australian dollars. In her message exchange with Mr. Shin, Fang mentioned that Bao Zhongguang had some physiological issues. Therefore, during the subsequent investigation, the police discovered that the two had no intimate relations that night. This also meant that Fang wouldn't have to do much, but could still earn more money. By the next day, she could return to Sydney as originally planned, without having to serve any additional clients there. That evening, Fang continued to send messages to Mr. Shin and a few other friends. At the time, Mr. Shin was attending a New Year's Eve party in a nearby suburb, and he reminded Fang, I'll pick you up from the hotel tomorrow morning. According to the schedule, Mr. Shin was supposed to take Fang to Adelaide Airport. At 12.06 a.m., they even exchanged New Year's greetings. Besides Mr. Shin, Fang was also messaging her roommate frequently. Her roommate's name was Fan Hui, a Chinese student studying abroad. The two had become roommates a month earlier. Fang had been very caring and attentive toward him, and although they were the same age, Fan Hui always called her older sister. He only knew that Fang worked in the beauty industry, and this time, she told him she was traveling to Melbourne. Fan Hai also mentioned that he planned to pick her up at the airport the next day. At 12.14 a.m., Fang wished Fan Hai a Happy New Year and asked where he was. The roommate responded, I'm sleeping at home and don't feel like going out. But Fang didn't reply to this message, possibly because she had already been murdered by then. Based on surveillance footage, Bao left the hotel hurriedly at 12.34 a.m. However, according to their agreement, he had paid extra to stay overnight until 6 a.m. the next morning. So why did this male client suddenly leave so early? After Bao left, no one else entered the room until 7 a.m. when Mr. Shin arrived at the scene of the crime. During that time frame, no one else went into the room. Clearly, Bao was the prime suspect in this case. Thus, at 11 p.m. on January 1st, 
police arrived at Bao's home in the Adelaide suburbs. He lived there with his wife and their eight-month-old son. When the police arrived, the whole family had already gone to bed. Despite it being the holiday season in Australia, the police acted urgently to find the perpetrator due to the severity of the crime. In this situation, Bao Zhongguang remained very calm. During the next two and a half hours of the search and interrogation, he maintained the same relaxed and carefree demeanor. Whether it was intentional or not, Bao's wife never entered the police interrogation room. He admitted to meeting Fang that day but claimed he wasn't her last client, as Fang had told him, I still have two more clients to serve. Therefore, Bao said he left the hotel a little after midnight. He added, I don't know anything about what happened after that, including Fang's murder. What further raised the police's suspicions was that in Bao's home, they couldn't find the pants or shoes he was wearing in the surveillance footage from that day. His phone conversations with Fang had also been completely deleted. Additionally, in his wallet and jeans, police found 1,250 Australian dollars. After the interrogation ended, police collected Bao's saliva sample for testing, along with his phone, clothes, and the cash. At this point in the investigation, although Bao was highly suspicious, there was no concrete evidence proving that he had murdered Fang Ting. Therefore, forensic experts focused on the autopsy, hoping to uncover more definitive clues. Experts were still unable to explain the crescent-shaped wound on Fang's head. The police searched the hotel room for anything that could have caused such a wound, but found nothing that matched. The most likely item was an iron, as the shape of the iron's head resembled the victim's wound. Could the killer have used it to strike Fang? However, there were no fingerprints or bloodstains on the iron. The case was at a standstill until they discovered a fingerprint on the heel of Fang's left high heel, which was also covered in blood. Based on the position of the fingerprint, police speculated that the killer had grabbed the heel and used it to strike the victim. The forensic doctor confirmed that the crescent-shaped wound on Fang's head matched the shape of the shoe's heel. Immediately, the police compared this fingerprint to the national database, but found no matches. However, it wasn't a dead end. Bao Zhongguang was summoned to the police station to have his fingerprints collected. The results were quickly determined, as expected. The fingerprint on Bao's right thumb was a perfect match to the one found on the victim's high heel. Facing intense police questioning, Bao remained calm. He defended himself by saying, I took Fang's shoes off that night, so it's normal for my fingerprints to be on her shoes. However, this explanation was unconvincing to the police, as removing the left shoe in the manner suggested by the position of the fingerprint would be highly unusual and difficult in normal circumstances. After a lengthy interrogation, around noon, the police arrested Bao on murder charges and informed him of his rights. However, in contrast to his previous cooperative attitude, Bao refused to answer any further questions, insisting, I didn't kill anyone. Although the suspect had been arrested, the case wasn't closed yet. The police still needed more reliable evidence. According to their investigation, Bao had arrived in Australia in 2010 and married a local woman. However, he had a bridging visa, meaning he was sponsored but didn't have permanent residency. Bao currently ran a cleaning business and often hired Chinese students as cleaners. The business appeared to be profitable, but Bao was known to be a gambling addict and had fallen into debt. He rarely had cash on hand and frequently borrowed money to balance his finances. The police also found that just before meeting Fang, Bao had pawned his white Volkswagen for 8,000 Australian dollars. The police quickly located the vehicle and discovered a sealed bag containing 18 razor blades in the driver's door compartment, identical to the ones found at the crime scene. Nearby, they also found a receipt dated December 5th, showing that he had made a payment to a local cleaning company. Even more concerning, before this meeting with Fang, Bao had lost all his money at the casino. When he met Fang, he didn't have a single dollar on him. Yet, Bao had still agreed to pay 600 Australian dollars more than the standard rate to stay overnight with her. This action raised significant suspicion. Where did Bao plan to get the money to pay Fang in such a situation? If we assume Bao Zhongguang was so caught up in the moment that he forgot about the money, 
Why did he carry those razor blades with him? This detail raises significant suspicion. At 6 p.m., Bao was taken into custody. However, the current evidence wasn't enough to convict him. Investigators speculated that Bao might have been pushed to his limits, targeting high-income sex workers. He was aware of these women's earnings, as this wasn't his first time engaging in such activities. In fact, a week before the crime, he had met another woman at the Minister Hotel. What's even more telling is that 40 minutes before meeting Fang, Bao received a threatening message on his phone, demanding that he repay his debt the next day. Police also discovered that all of his bank accounts were either frozen or had no money. Piecing these events together, along with the fact that half of Fang's earnings were missing and that Bao was found with 1,250 Australian dollars in cash the next day, plus the discovery that he had deposited 1,000 Australian dollars into an ATM, it all started to come together. Additionally, police learned that Fang had recently purchased a new iPhone, but it was missing after the crime. In Bao's phone search history, they found keywords like how to unlock an iPhone without knowing the password. Surveillance footage from the night of the crime, specifically at 12.34 a.m. after Bao left the hotel, showed him not leaving immediately. Instead, he ran around the nearby streets for a few minutes before returning to his car, as if trying to calm down from some intense emotions. Police speculated that that night, Bao may have told Fang that he was going to withdraw money from the ATM to pay for the overnight stay. However, Fang likely didn't trust him and insisted on going with him. In desperation, Bao bent down, pretending to put on his shoes, then grabbed one of her high heels and attacked Fang. Once she was confused and caught off guard, he used the razor blade to assault her. Another theory suggested that Bao might have attacked Fang when she entered the bathroom. While the case was still under investigation, on January 12, 2015, Fang Ting's parents and brother arrived in Australia from China, unaware that their beloved daughter had been working as a high-end tour guide. They knew that Fang had left home at the age of 17 to study physiotherapy at the University of Sydney. Her father was a taxi driver and her mother worked in a factory. They had been sending her a monthly allowance, but to reduce the financial burden on her family, Fang had also taken on part-time jobs in supermarkets, restaurants, or salons to support herself. After graduating, Fang did not return to her hometown, but chose to stay in Sydney. Initially, she continued working at a salon, and later, there were reports that she transitioned to working at a study abroad company in Sydney. Eventually, she moved on to her current job at a travel company, which offered her a higher salary. Her career was going well before this tragic incident occurred. At this point, Fang's parents and brother were devastated by her death. Tragically, they arrived from China to Australia without enough money to arrange a funeral for their daughter. As a result, the local Chinese community organized a fundraising event to help cover the funeral costs. Because of Fang's heartbreaking circumstances, everyone was eager to see the moment when the perpetrator would be brought to justice. Finally, on August 17, 2016, the Adelaide Supreme Court officially opened the trial for Fang's case. During the trial, Bao adamantly denied all charges, insisting that he didn't commit the crime. He argued that there was no direct evidence proving his guilt, and that the police should not rely solely on the information from Fang's cell phone to accuse him. However, almost no one in the courtroom supported the defendant, not even his wife. All the evidence pointed to Bao. The prosecution presented key pieces of evidence. Surveillance footage showing that he was the last person to come into contact with the victim, the fact that there were no secret exits in the room, the fingerprint on Fang's high heel, which was also the murder weapon that caused the crescent-shaped wounds, and the razor blade similar to those used by Bao. Additionally, the cash found on him and his significant financial motive couldn't be explained satisfactorily by the defendant. In the end, the judge sentenced Bao to 25 years in prison without the possibility of parole for intentional murder. However, many people were dissatisfied with the sentence. They believed that if Bao Zhongguang had been tried in China, he would likely have received the death penalty or at least a life sentence. Nonetheless, this was the final verdict handed down by the court, which in some ways brought justice for Fang Ting and could be seen as a reasonable conclusion. Yet, 
I still have one lingering question. Why did a bright, promising graduate like Fang choose this line of work? She could have opted for a safer, better job. Was it solely because of the high earnings? After hearing this story, you can see that sometimes money isn't everything. In this case, it was the fact that the killer knew she had money that led to this tragedy. And that brings us to the end of this video. Thank you for watching. Goodbye, and see you in the next video.